Exodus chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3 this morning. We're going to start here in Exodus chapter 3. We read the passage from verses 7 down through verse 11. I'm going to preach a message, and I'm going to entitle that message, Were They Actually Excuses? Okay, were they actually excuses? And the reason I'm titling uh, the message like that, a while back I preached a message, uh, I think I called it Reasons Why Christians Don't Serve God. And that message was based largely on Exodus chapter 3 and Exodus chapter 4 and dealt with what I termed as, I had termed as excuses that Moses had made. And, and I, I don't want you to misunderstand me. Uh, the point of that message is no less true today than it was when I first preached it. Uh, if there's one thing, though, that I have learned uh, over the, the past 30 plus years of walking with Christ uh, and really studying his word, is that we are constantly learning. Okay? Uh, there are things we might think, uh, and then as we study God's word, uh, we get corrected on some things, and things are revealed to us. And I believe that is why Paul gave the charge to Timothy to study. Now, I have found that more, the more I learn and the more I soak in things from the Word of God, uh, I become uh, so much more aware of the things that I don't know, uh, things that, that you know, I, I, you know I, I don't really have an answer for. And as I was studying through Acts recently, I came across some scriptures that have given me, I guess you could say, an entirely different view of this passage in Exodus. And this morning, I want to revisit those responses that Moses gave to God and look at them in light of some evidence that I had overlooked previously. In Exodus 3 and 4, I had outlined three different excuses that Moses was making. Uh, I think number one, the, the, the first excuse I had, I had uh, referenced was that he was stuck on self. And we see that from chapter 3, verse 11. Uh, and, uh, basically, Moses responded to the call of God with a, who am I that I should go? And, and the point that I had made was that it's not about us, it's about God. And, uh, you know, you'd never, you, you best never hide behind who you are as a reason not to serve God. Now, I believe that's a true statement. I believe that's a, a, a true thing. But again, as I said, I, I don't know if Moses is making excuses here, and I'll get to that in a moment. The second one that I highlighted was is that uh, he, he said they wouldn't believe me. Basically, he was hiding behind others. In Exodus chapter 4, verse number 1, you'll see Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me. Basically, Moses' response to God's call was is that they wouldn't listen. And the reality is, there are many people in this world today that have long ago rejected the very idea and concept that there is a creator. They have bought hook, line, and sinker into this idea of evolution and that they are their own gods and they have total control over their own lives and they have dismissed God altogether. And that really largely means that many won't listen to us from the start. But that in no way negates our responsibility to preach the gospel. It doesn't negate our responsibility to tell people the truth. It does not hinge upon whether they're going to believe it or not. And of course, the third excuse I used is that he was stuck on his own abilities. And that goes down to verse number 10, where it says that Moses said unto the Lord, chapter 4, Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. The third response, an excuse that I highlighted from Moses dealt with basically, it was centered around his own abilities. He basically said that he was not eloquent, but he was slow of speech. And he basically told God to send someone else. Now, I will say this, I think all three of these excuses that I highlighted 
show themselves in the life of a believer. And they should never be used as a crutch to hold someone back from serving the Lord. But, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 7 with me. Acts chapter number 7. And I just want you to bear with me. I'm going to read through a passage here. Beginning in verse number 20. The Bible says in verse 20, In which time Moses was born, and was exceeding fair, and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptian, and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full forty years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed, and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not. And the next day he showed himself uh, unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do you wrong one another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled, and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt. I have heard their groaning, and am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness forty years. Can I say this morning I love reading the scriptures? I love studying the Word of God. And sometimes you read things, and uh, how many people can attest to this? They fly, it flies right over your head. You read something, and you read it again, and, and you still don't know what it's saying. Sometimes uh, there are passages you might have to read uh, up to a hundred times before something finally sinks in. And honestly, I think I found that to be the case here in Acts chapter 7. And honestly, I look at Acts chapter 7, I see it as a turning point in the book of Acts. It's the, the final rejection of the Messiah. It's the rejection of... Uh, of the uh, elders, the rulers of Israel, the, the priesthood uh, uh, of the Holy Ghost. Given the opportunity to, to look and see Christ standing on the right hand of God, they refused. They stoned Stephen. Stephen himself said later on in verse 51, he says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist what? The Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. And of course, as Stephen is stoned, we are introduced to, of all people, it's the coat check guy. The guy who's holding the coats, a guy named Saul. Now, of course, we understand later on that Saul would be the one who becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. And he kind of carries out that transition uh, where uh, salvation turns to the Gentiles. And I think, admittedly, as I read through Acts chapter 7, I think many times I kind of have Israel's rejection in the back of my mind. Knowing uh, what's going to happen, sometimes, you know, as I'm reading through the, 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 the first several verses, I'm thinking about what's going to happen at the end. 
How many people get like that when they're reading the Bible? How many people, when you start reading, say 1 Samuel 17, and, and you know that there's the two armies gathered together with the valley in between, and uh, along comes David, how many people are already thinking about how it's going to end? You get excited about the victory. But I want you to reconsider some of the things that I have had to reconsider about Moses as we look at Acts chapter 7. And I say that because for years I have viewed those responses of Moses in Exodus 3 and 4 as just plain excuses. Reasons, uh, you know, why this great prophet of God uh, would, you know, uh, just uh, trying to weasel his way out of doing what God wanted him to do. But as I read through Acts 7, I was alerted to something that I've never noticed prior. I don't know if I hadn't noticed it, but it just never dawned on me. I've certainly read it many times, but I want you to read what it says in verses 23 down through verse 25. The Bible says, and when he was full 40 years old. So this is when Moses was 40. It came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God, by his hand, would deliver them, but they understood not. You know, this passage, as I said, is discussing Moses when he was not 80 years old. It's when he was 40 years old. And I, I tell you what, when I, 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 just over the past couple of weeks as I read this, it just kind of jumped out. It was almost like there was flashing lights saying, hey, pay attention to me. And I was reading that, and I want you to read verse 25 again. It says, For he supposed his brethren would have understand how that God, by his hand, would deliver them. But they understood not. When Moses was 40 years old, he understood that he was going to be involved with the deliverance of his people. Now, let me ask a question this morning. Is that new to anyone in here? Is that something that you never really thought of? Because I'll be honest with you, uh, for the last 30 some odd years, I've been, uh, you know, really studying the Bible. I've always thought that it was when Moses was 80, when he got that call at the burning bush. That's when Moses was filled in with God's plan. And what God wanted Moses to do. But the Bible says here in Acts chapter 7, verse 25, that Moses supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not. That fact had never once dawned on me. I think I've read that passage hundreds of times, but it never sunk in. It never got digested until just recently. I was oblivious to the idea that Moses knew something about him being part of the deliverance of the people prior to Exodus 3. Yet it was always in the book. And listen, it reminds me and encourages me and just you know fortifies that whole idea that we ought to study. Why we read the Bible and we read it again, and then we read it again and we just keep reading it because there's always things we can learn from it. But as I began to read the passage and look back at Exodus 3 and 4, uh, you know, it caused me to, to reconsider what I had called the excuses of Moses. I, I don't, and what, what I'm telling you this morning is I don't think that these responses from Mo, Moses were excuses at all. I don't see Moses trying to weasel his way out of doing what God wanted to do. Instead, 
I see these responses from Moses as maybe valid concerns. Maybe some questions that he had. These were genuine questions, but albeit from a faulty perspective. And let me explain that this morning. I want you to go back to those questions again. Head back to Exodus chapter 3. Keep your, your bookmark or whatever, your hand, your finger, whatever, and Acts chapter 7. We're going to be back there in a second. But notice Exodus chapter 3, verse number 11. Well, in verse 10, when God says, I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? I don't believe that Moses was trying to play the... uh, I'm a nobody card as an excuse, but hear me on this. I think it's coming from a lack of understanding. Look back at Acts chapter 7, and look what it says in verse 21. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for what? For her own son. Do you realize that that would have made Moses a prince in Egypt? That would have given Moses clout. It would have given Moses power that the Hebrews wouldn't have had. It would have given Moses prestige. He would have been on uh, what we could call the who's who's list of Egypt at the time. And consider that long before this in Egypt, the child of Israel was used to save the people from starvation and death. How many people remember reading about a guy named Joseph? And that salvation was accomplished through the man's position as number two next to the Pharaoh. See, it was through Joseph's position that allowed the children of Israel to be preserved in Egypt. And the more I consider verse 25, where the Bible tells us that Moses supposed that it was by his hand God would deliver the people, the more it made sense that it would not have been a stretch for Moses to suppose that it would have been through his stature in Egypt. The fact that he was a prince in Egypt. The fact that he was raised in the Pharaoh's household and that he had an ear before the Pharaoh, before the Pharaoh's daughter. Perhaps Moses supposed that it would be through those connections to the Pharaoh and his position in the kingdom. Now, as you fast forward 40 years to the burning bush, as we come to Exodus chapter 3, God says, I want you to go to Pharaoh. And I just have this picture of the wheels turning inside of Moses' head. I'm no longer in Pharaoh's household. (laughs) I'm no longer in a place where the Pharaoh has my ear. In fact, he sought to slay me. I'm no longer a prince in Egypt. And listen, if that's what Moses is thinking, then you can understand how we could respond by saying, Who am I? that I should go. Listen, the Bible says there in verse 25, for he supposed his brother would have understood how that God, by his hand, Moses thought that it was by his hand that he would deliver the people. And it would be natural, considering the history of Joseph, that to think that it had something to do with his position in the royal family. Forty years later, that position has long since been dissolved. All that clout, all that power, all that prestige, it's gone. And the reason I say that is it makes this less of an excuse, but more as a a legitimate concern that Moses had. Hear me on this, because if Moses is thinking that it's through his position, through his position in the royal family that he's going to deliver the people, 
and that's taken away, then I totally understand why Moses is saying, who am I? Why would you send me? Because it's clear from Acts chapter 7 that 40 years earlier, when Moses was 40 years old, he understood that he was going to be involved in that deliverance, didn't he? Look at the second thing. In Exodus chapter 4, Exodus chapter 4, verse number 1, Second thing Moses says is, and Moses answered and said, But behold, they not, will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. The next response Moses had was, is, They will not believe me. And again, I, I've always saw this as an excuse, but notice what happens in the book of Acts in verse 25. He supposed his brethren would have understood, but what does the Bible say? They understood not. In fact, look down at what it says in verse 35. This Moses whom they, what? Refused. They refused him 40 years earlier. And we understand the context because it's when they said, who made thee a ruler and a judge? Moses was rejected by his brethren when he was a man of stature, a man of power. When he was a prince in Egypt, he was refused and rejected by his brethren. Now, think about this. Now God's coming to Moses and say, I want you to go to Pharaoh. Moses says, who am I? If Moses' thought was is that it was all about who he was in the Pharaoh's household, then how, and the people rejected him 40 years ago, how are the people going to believe when he's no longer in the Pharaoh's household? I can almost see Moses just sitting there scratching his head. They refused me 40 years ago. There's no way on earth they're going to believe me today. And what I'm saying is, is I don't think these, this is an excuse, but I think it's a legitimate concern. Because uh, from what I see, it's like Moses, I think, thought that, that it was through his position, through his power, that they were going to be delivered. Notice the third excuse that I highlighted. You can see that in chapter 4 and verse Number 10, it says, And Moses said unto the Lord, Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. You know, I had always seen this as an excuse. But notice what the Bible says about Moses in Acts chapter 7, verse 22. <coughs> And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. Do you notice how it says that Moses was mighty in words? Yet in Exodus chapter 4, Moses is saying, I'm not eloquent. I'm slow of speech. But again, that training in the wisdom of the Egyptians, that mighty in words, happened when? Forty years prior to that. Folks, it's been demonstrated in society how society shapes our speech and our vocabulary. Eh? <laughs> Isn't that what a lot of people say about Canadians? Listen, if you were to go spend a year in the Deep South, you would come back with a little bit of an accent. Your speech would adapt. You'd be saying things like, y'all. You'd pick up on that. and you, 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 it, it, that those things that, uh, you, You'd grab those things and, and put them into your dialect. If you were to go spend a couple years in Australia, you'd pick up the accent. You'd be calling everybody mate. 
They meet. I had a friend growing up who had moved here from Wales when he was young. And he slowly picked up, you know, I, I don't, I, I call everything else an accent, but he picked up our accent. But when he was in his house, man, he'd be right back into that Welsh accent. And sometimes it'd be hard to even understand what they were saying. But the point I'm making is, is that there was a time when Moses understood the wisdom of the Egyptians. There was a time when he was well trained, when he was mighty in words and mighty in deeds. And Moses probably supposed that it was not only through his position in the Pharaoh's household, not only uh, was it, uh, uh, but it was also would have been because he was mighty in words and deeds. And because of those abilities that he had. But for the last 40 years, he'd spend his time what? Probably talking to sheep. You know, 30 years ago, I had just finished my last semester at university. And I, I had a strong knowledge of calculus, which we use quite a bit in problem solving. I was able to integrate many different and challenging equations. And you're probably listening to this thing, and I have no idea what preacher's talking about right now. Utilizing partial derivatives, I could calculate the volume of three-dimensional objects, but I'm going to tell you that after 30 years, you forget that stuff. I don't, I wouldn't remember how to do that. And I am sure that Moses was being 100% honest and sincere. He was there in Egypt 40 years ago, and, and he may have thought that, hey, it was through my place in the Pharaoh's household. It was through my training. It was through me being mighty in, in, in words and deeds that the people would be delivered. But they didn't believe me then. When I was mighty in words, when I did have that position in Pharaoh's household. So what does Moses say? God, I'm not eloquent anymore. Uh, my speech is slow now. It's been 40 years. I would have lost some of that wisdom of the Egyptians. He would have lost that eloquence. He would have lost that mightiness in words. Now let me just bring everything to a conclusion here. In saying all that, I see these objections of Moses, not as excuses anymore, but they tend to be honest, legitimate concerns. But I think it is coming from an improper understanding that he had. Look back at what it says in Acts chapter 7, verse 25. The Bible says, For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God, and I want you to notice that next expression there, by his hand, would deliver them. Moses had this idea that it was up to Moses. Moses had this idea that it was going to be by his hand. And yes, I think Moses thought that, hey, it, it was through his stature in Egypt, through his position in Pharaoh's household, uh, that Moses was going to be believed. And, and it was through his ability to be mighty in words that the people would be delivered. But I challenge you to take the time and study and observe how many times, especially in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses refers to this phrase, Mighty hand. In fact, let me show you one of those places. Exodus chapter 32. We'll start in Exodus chapter 32. I'm going to show you three different times we see it used. Twice by Moses and once by Joshua. Look at Exodus 32. Look at verse number 11. It says, And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with 
Notice what he says. A mighty hand. Now, Moses, by Exodus 32, understood that the people came out of Egypt by whose mighty hand? It was God's. Look at Deuteronomy 6. Head over to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Look at verse 21. Deuteronomy 6, verse number 21. It says, Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. Whose mighty hand was it? It was the Lord's. Look at Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4. Look at verse 23. The Bible says, For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over. And then notice what he says. As the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty. You notice how there's a reference to the hand of the Lord? that it is mighty, and the reverence is back at the Red Sea. Listen, it was not the hand of Moses. It was always the mighty hand of God that was going to deliver the people. Sometimes I think we can get confused like Moses. We can get the idea that it's by our hands and by our abilities and that everything rises and falls upon us. I honestly, looking back and reading Acts chapter 7, and looking back in Exodus 3 and 4, I honestly believe Moses was confused. Because when he was 40 years old, and he supposed that he was supposed to deliver the people, he thought it was through Moses. He thought it was through His mighty words. He thought it was through his position. I'm thinking he probably spent the next 40 years wondering why the people didn't believe him. Why they refused him. When God calls to him from the bush, Moses says, who am I? (laughs) They say, I'm not in the Pharaoh's household any longer. He says, they won't believe me. Listen, they rejected me back when I did have a a, a position in the Pharaoh's household, when I could do something. Do you think they're going to believe me now? And then he says, what? In Exodus chapter 4, verse number 11, he says, I'm not eloquent. It's been a long time since I've gave any fancy speeches. Or since I showed any might with any words. It's been a long time since I've had any uh, dealings with the wisdom of the Egyptians. But I love what happens in Exodus chapter 5. I want you to look back at Exodus 5 with me. I tell you, this, I get goosebumps when I read this. I, I just think this is exciting. So Moses did what God told him. He goes to the Pharaoh. He says, let my people go. What happens? Pharaoh says, man, you guys got too much time on your hands. You know what? From now on, you're going to gather your own strife. It's just, hey, he makes it tougher on them. So what does Moses do? He comes to, uh, back to God, and look what it says in verse 22. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? And then notice what he says. Why is it? that thou hast sent me. Why is it that thou hast sent me? I know about you, but it's almost like Moses is saying, hey, listen, I told you. I told you back at that burning bush to send someone else. 
Look at verse 23. He says, For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people, neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. And then notice he says, For since I came to Pharaoh, do you get the sense that Moses still feels it has something to do with him? Well, look at the response. I love the response in Exodus 6 1. The Bible says, Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt, and what's that next word? Say it with me. Thou. You know that thou means God is referring to Moses. In this path, he's not referring to everyone, even though everyone's going to get to see. But he's going to show Moses something. He says, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. Moses, it's not about what you can do. It's not about you know your position in the royal family. It's not about how mighty in words you are. It's about what I am going to do. It's almost like God was saying, Moses, you saw what you can do. Now let me show you what I can do. It's as if God's saying, hey, Moses, you saw what can be done by your hands. Now let me show you what my mighty hand can do. I'm going to close with this. Head over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse number 26. 1 Corinthians 1, verse number 26. The Bible reads there, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Hmm. <laughs> Does that ring a bell, Moses? But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. And look at verse 29. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. Folks, someone may have all the education in the world. He may be mighty in words and deeds. He may have all the nobility. But at the end of the day, understand this, all God wants is obedience. You don't need the wisdom of the world. You don't need to be mighty in words and deeds. You don't need to have a position of rank or some artificial nobility. God just wants you to obey. Because He wants to show Himself mighty through you. You know, I look at this account of Moses, and I may be wrong in this, because the Bible doesn't come out and say it, But it's almost like God had to show Moses the work that God was going to do. And it's like Moses had this idea that he had some great work that he had to do. Forty years later, I think that idea was still kicking around in his head. That's why he said, Who am I? That's why he said, they're not going to believe me. That's why he said, I'm not eloquent. Because he thought that all those things were essential. Because Moses had the understanding, according to Acts chapter 7, verse 25, that it was by his hand that the people would be delivered. And God says, no. (laughs) No, Moses. It's not your hand, it's my hand. 
It's through my mighty hand that the people are going to be delivered. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you into the desert for a little while. So you can lose your stature. You can lose that wisdom. You can become slow of speech. And that way, before the people know about my mighty hand, you're going to know that I'm going to deliver the people through my mighty hand. Listen, can I just encourage you today? Never let the lack of certain things or certain abilities question God's desire to use you. I believe that's what Moses was actually doing here. He thought that all those things, whether it was position in the Pharaoh's household, whether it was his training in Egypt, the fact that at one time he was mighty in words and deeds, he thought that all those things were essential. God says, no. I want you to go to Pharaoh. <laughs> Tell him to let my people go. God just wanted him to obey. It wasn't about all that stuff. I think sometimes believers can get confused into thinking that they're lacking something. Or there's something missing. Something needs to be in place or this needs to be a, a, a part of the, the program. When the reality of it is... is God wants all the glory. And God just wants us to obey. Listen, don't get caught up with the questions that Moses had. And listen, again, I, I preached that message on excuses. Those excuses are valid today. People do make excuses for not serving God. But the more and more as I study this out and I look at these things, I think these were sincere questions that Moses had because he thought everything was dependent upon him. When in reality, it was all dependent upon God. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you that we can study it, that we can learn from it. Uh, Lord, even when we miss things, that you can still turn the light on for us. Lord, we just want to be used of you. We don't want the glory. We don't want the honor. We just want to see you lifted up and magnified. And Father, I pray that you would encourage us. Many times these questions, these honest questions that Moses had might show themselves in our life. How can you do this when we don't have, an, how, how can, Lord, help us just to settle on obedience. Understand that you will do the work. You will accomplish things. There are things that are just out of our control, out of our power. You just want us to be obedient. Lord, help us to settle on that obedience. Lord, help us not to think that there might be some special qualities we need to serve you. Some special abilities, maybe some position, maybe some... Whatever it is, Lord, I, I pray that we would get that idea and that concept out of our head. And the, we would just simply obey you so that we could be used of you. Lord, I pray you challenge us, speak to us this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.